Hey everyone, welcome back to Benchy Tests. You join me in the second and final part of our little mini-series on the upgrade we're doing to our GPU test bench, which also happens to be our editing rig and um, my own personal gaming rig as well. For those of you who haven't seen the first part or just can't remember what happened, what we're going to be doing is swapping out the 6700K that's currently in the system for a Ryzen 7 2700 in an attempt to fix some issues we're seeing in DaVinci Resolve. Apologies for the background noise because the window's open right now and there's cars and trucks passing by and stuff. But yeah, um, we're trying to fix some issues we had in DaVinci Resolve, which were stuttering when scrubbing through the timeline and or performance issues when scrubbing, scrubbing, or scrubbing, blah, blah, blah. scrubbing through the timeline. Um, I'm, I'm leaving that bit in the video, but yeah. Performance issues when scrubbing through the timeline and issues with stuttering when trying to play back the footage when checking for errors before actually rendering the video. Now, that actually turned out not to be caused by the CPU, um, unfortunately. So yeah, uh, I'll go into a bit more about that later on. We were running 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM at 2800 megahertz. It was a 2400 megahertz kit, but we overclocked it to 2800 megahertz with CL11131331 13, timings. Now, that actually turned out to be unstable. Um, I went back and tested it on the 6700K system as well, and that also turned out to be unstable with those settings. So we ditched that RAM um, and swapped it in with some Micron DDI based DDR4 RAM, uh, 16 gigabytes as well, same capacity. Also a 2400 megahertz kit, but we overclocked that to 3000 megahertz with CL16181838 timings, which were stable with. Um, around 1.47 to 1.48 volts, which is perfectly safe for DDR4 voltages. Another change we've also made to the system since the previous video is that we've also swapped around the orientation of the rear fan, background to an exhaust. We had it as an intake before in an attempt to give more air to the CPU rad for hopefully better cooling, but we never actually tested that. So for now, considering that a rear exhaust is the recommended configuration for a top-mounted rad system, we've gone back to that as an exhaust. So yeah, uh, now that we've got that out of the way, what we're, what we're going to be doing today is going through an initial test build of the system. Now we're going to do that on top of the cardboard box the motherboard came in, so that we can just test out the parts, see if they all work together, see if everything's working fine before we actually go to the effort of putting it into the system. Um, and then we're going to move on to benchmarks in games and DaVinci Resolve, comparing them to the 6700K just to see if this upgrade was even worth it in the first place. So yeah, um, now that that's out of the way, it's probably time to roll the intro. So, join me in my illustrious garage here. So, um, apologies first up for the background noise because this is my garage and there is a main road not too far from here, so you're probably going to be hearing a lot of background noise, which I'll try to deal with as best as I possibly can. So yeah, I'll get to building that and then we'll get um, an initial boot to see if it's working. So yeah, I'll fast forward it from here on. Right, so there we go. That's that's got it all ready for testing. Um, we've got everything on the motherboard, everything plugged in, enough for testing anyway. Um, the stock AMD cooler we put on, you should be looking at the camera up there, not over there where the screen is. But, um, yeah, the stock AMD cooler we put on, that is only there for testing. As I said in the first part, we are going to be using a cracking uh, X61 from NXT. NXT? No, that's wrestling. NZXT. But yeah, um, I'm going to turn the camera around and get ready for the first boot. 
So yeah, let's go see if this actually works. Alright, so we're ready for the first boot now, so here we go. Let's hope for the best. It is switched on, as you can see, and spinning. So yeah, let's just wait to see if it actually posts. Ha! Ah, here we go, it's posting! Much postage is occurring! So it's asking me to put it in slots 2 and 4. Right, so that is, a is actually better slots. See, slots 1 and 3 are normally perfectly fine, because um, 1 and 3 and 2 and 4 are the two channels on the majority of motherboards. So yeah, let's quickly get that changed over and then we'll boot back into the BIOS. Ha! Here we go. We have postage. Yes. You can probably tell how excited I was for this upgrade. So yeah, um, that CPU temperature probably is correct. Now, the reason the CPU temperature is that low is because I'm in Scotland, it's cold, that's kind of our thing. So yeah, we can sit around in the garage and probably near zero temperatures. I'm not really surprised the CPU temperature is that low. But yeah, so obviously it's not going to be like that once we've actually got the um, system built proper. So yeah, everything seems to work. So uh, yeah, uh, before we get on to the benchmark now, so um, I'll turn the camera off, get everything built, and then I'll bring you the benchmarks. Now, speaking about benchmarks, we're not going to be running this like a usual CPU or GPU test ben or benchmark where um, you would sort of control the settings to try to get the most out of what particular part you're testing, because this is also my personal gaming rig, so I'm going to be testing the games at settings which I would actually use. So for pretty much every game, the GPU, the GTX 1080 that we're using, is going to be the bottleneck of the system, not the CPU. So you, you, sh you should expect the benchmarks in the games to actually be fairly similar between the 6700K and the 2700, if not actually identical. We're also going to be doing benchmarks in DaVinci Resolve. And for that, we're going to be using actual projects that we've rendered for the channel so that we can get performance figures representative of what we actually do on the channel. So yeah, with that out of the way, let's actually get on with the benchmarks. Cinebench R20 is a tile-based rendering benchmark, meaning that the image to be rendered gets split into separate tiles, with each CPU thread being allocated a single tile to work on. And given that the 2700 not only has double the thread count of the 6700K, 16 versus 8, it has twice the physical cores, so despite the deficit in clock speed and IPC, it pulls far ahead of the 6700K in tile-based rendering applications, such as Cinebench R20 and Blender for example. The 2700 across three runs managed an average score of 4106 points, putting it a massive 61.78% up on the 6700K score of 2538. A huge improvement, but not one that particularly matters to us. Not yet anyway, as we don't do any tile-based rendering here outside of CPU benchmarks. Firestrike is a synthetic benchmark built to showcase DirectX 11, but given that it's a synthetic benchmark, it isn't necessarily representative of real-world gaming performance. It provides a combined score at the end of the test, made up of two graphics tests, a CPU-based physics test, and a combined test using both the CPU and the GPU. We ran the benchmark three times and averaged the scores as Firestrike has a lot of variance run to run in scores. The physics portion of it, we were expecting a big gap in favour of the 2700, which it managed to achieve with a score of 21,817.67 points, putting it nearly 50% ahead of the 6700K, showing just how much more power the 2700 has in synthetic benchmarks with its four extra physical cores. The 2700 was 3% down in graphics score compared to the 6700K, and only 1.24% better in combined which is within run-to-run -run variance, so it's effectively equal. And despite the 1000 point gap in overall score, this equates to only a 5.29% difference. Kicking off the gaming tests is GTA 5, which we're running with max settings at 1440p, with 2 times MSAA and TXAA enabled as well. All advanced settings are off, or at their lowest settings, 
as they cause a huge drop in GPU usage on both configurations for some reason. Neither CPU had any issues here as expected due to neither actually being maxed out due to the GPU bottleneck. The 6700K did however see higher usage during the test though. That said, the 6700K managed a slightly higher average frame rate of 88 versus the 2700's 83, putting the 6700K 6% ahead. 1% and 0.1% lows were also a bit better on the 6700K, with 6.78 and 9.62% increases over the 2700 respectively. As said, both of these configurations run great, so in our case are in effect equal. Rise of the Tomb Raider saw another drop in performance for the 2700, with more of a gap between the two than GT5 showed. Both systems had issues with GPU usage dropping significantly into the 70s, causing some pretty noticeable micro-stuttering. Although, like GT5, the CPU wasn't actually bottlenecking here, so the cause of it is unknown for now. The stuttering with the 6700K though was noticeably less severe than the 2700, evidenced by the much better 1% low, 47, 20.51% ahead of the 2700's 39 FPS. Although, according to the frame time graphs, with the 6700K, there were single spikes in frame times more significant than those of the 2700. 0.1% lows and average frame rates were effectively equal here though. Doom, as you've probably guessed based on the previous two games, performed pretty similar on both CPUs due to the 1080 yet again being the bottleneck in performance. The massively different 0.1% lows were most likely due to the 2700 possibly spending more time in cutscenes, which is down to human error due to us not actually skipping them fast enough so the 0.1% lows here can be disregarded. There was less than a 3% difference between the 2700 and 6700K in average and 1% low frame rates, which won't be noticeable at all due to the really high frame rates both can achieve anyway. The 6700K was actually stuck at the game's 200 FPS limit at times throughout the test. According to CapFrameX, which we used to get our benchmark data on this game, the 2700 did in fact have a couple of spikes in frame times of 87 milliseconds, with one of 51 milliseconds. The worst that the 6700K had was 48 milliseconds. Both had smaller spikes throughout at times, although neither had any that would actually be noticeable due to how high the frame rate is. Moving on to performance in video editing and rendering, and like mentioned before, we're using actual video projects we rendered for the channel. With the first test being the first part of the Upgrade miniseries, which ran for 7 minutes and 11 seconds, and consisted of multiple 1080p 30fps clips with one 1080p 60fps clip. It features colour grading throughout with some simple transitions, and is rendered at 1440p 60fps at 30 megabits per second, with linear PCM audio. We render at 1440p as the higher bitrate YouTube allocates to 1440p video actually improves the video quality, despite the source footage still being 1080p. In hindsight, we should have rendered this at 30fps instead, but we can't change that now. As the chart shows, the 2700 improves massively over the 6700K in this type of render, with a render time of 7 minutes and 39 seconds, compared to the 13 minutes and 15 seconds with the 6700K, an improvement of 42.26% over the Intel chip. Throughout the render, the 2700 often hits 60fps, which is almost double what the 6700K was doing, as that only managed just over 30fps at the best. This project isn't particularly representative of what we normally render though, as our videos usually consist of mainly 1080p60 footage, with multiple overlays and several uses of fusion effects as well. The second project represents what we normally render, as it is the project for the video we did on unlocking a triple core AMD Phenom's disabled 4th core. It consists of multiple 1080p 60fps clips of gameplay footage, with the bits to camera recorded at 1080p 30fps. There is colour grading on all of the bits done to camera, simple transitions between clips, use of stabilisation, some fusion effects and multiple uses of overlays. The project is also rendered at 1440p 60, 30 megabits per second, with linear PCM audio. The clips in this project were all converted to Apple ProRes in an attempt to fix the stuttering issues we talked about in the previous video, as H.264 can be hard to work with on occasion. This turned out to have no effect whatsoever though. 
So the difference between the 6700K and 2700 is far smaller in the type of projects we normally work with here, as the chart on screen shows. 2700 still made a decent improvement over the 6700K, but only by 3 minutes and 54 seconds, or 14.43%, far from the improvement we expected here. So yeah, um, to conclude on whether it was actually worth the money upgrading it, um, I want to say yes because for me personally it was a lot of money, but looking at it objectively, we only took three or four minutes off of the render time in the second DaVinci Resolve test. So yeah, um, objectively speaking though, it, it wasn't worth it at all, at least for what we do on the channel on a regular basis. But speaking for myself and not the channel, um, I would say it was worth it because I love playing with computer components. Um, the most cores in any CPU I've ever had in my entire life is four. I've never had a CPU with this many cores. So to me personally, it's, it's pretty cool having an eight core CPU. Like having an eight core CPU, it's, ah, I can't explain it. It just seems so, so damn cool to me. But yeah, um, as I said, objectively speaking, it wasn't particularly worth it for what you're doing. But in our defence, we didn't actually know um, that the CPU wasn't the cause of the stuttering issues we were seeing. We didn't know at that point that it was the overlays causing that problem. Um, we still don't know why the overlays are causing that problem. So if anyone out there can shed any light on that, that would be fantastic. So we can actually fix that and improve the performance massively because Honestly, it's, it's so juddery trying to watch it back, uh, watch the video back before rendering it. It's seriously, seriously annoying. So yeah, we'd really, really appreciate some outside input on that. Um, we tried to figure it out ourselves as well. But yeah, uh, we only tested three games. Um, just to change the subject a bit. We only tested three games in the benchmarks. Um, initially, we had tested a fourth one, namely Warframe. But we later decided to drop that benchmark because but we later decided to drop that benchmark because um, although we do the exact same mission uh, for each test, the starting point for the mission or the sort of path the mission takes can actually vary from mission to mission, even though it's uh, effectively the same mission. So the results we get from that aren't particularly fair. But but yeah, uh, for now, I wasn't particularly worth it, the upgrade, but as I said, for me, it's, it's I find it really cool having an 8-core CPU. It's a new toy to play with, so the value I get from that, to be honest for me personally, it does make it worth it. Before we finish up today, I'd like to give shoutouts to Patreon supporters Tazvi Dodge and Shadow in the Void for helping to make all of this possible. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a comment and a like, and subscribing to our channel if you'd like to see more content like this and maybe even sharing the video with people you think may enjoy it. And although there's no obligation whatsoever to do so, you can support us in creating these videos through Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Benchy Tests, or through Kofi at kofi.com forward slash Benchy Tests. And if you do decide to become a patron, you'll gain early access to all of our videos for as long as you remain a patron. So thanks for watching our video. It really means a lot to us that you take the time to watch our content. Hopefully we'll see you in the next one.